Music musicians and singers we appreciate that. Tonight uh, we have with us Pastor Carlos Olivas from Indio, California. He's here uh, bringing his uh, grandkids home and I've asked him to preach for us tonight since he was with us. But as I was just thinking about it, um, he was, he's a, a homie in that he's from New Mexico and from Española. He was in the Española church as a young man. He got saved young and was raised up in that church and then eventually became the pastor of, of his own church, of his mother church. And I thought about Mario and Lydia. They were saved in Mammoth, Arizona. And he eventually became the pastor of his, his mother church, his home church. And God has moved in the lives of these men. Uh, Carlos, I remember when he was pastoring in Española, was a great help, a real blessing. As I got to know him after I moved here, and uh, when he started that boot camp, he was directly involved and a part of the staff and was a great help in getting that boot camp off the ground. And when he uh, left uh, for China, we really missed them. And uh, when they came back to the States, they were given the work in Indio, California, a thriving church, a mother church, and a church that is responsible for a Bible conference in Guatemala. And uh, Carlos has been raised up by God to be in that place of leadership. And uh, God is really using our brother there. And uh, as you may remember, he went through a bout with uh, leukemia. It was kind of unexpected, but God really came through. And our brother came through with flying colors. He's healed today. And uh, in a certain sense, he's my, I consider him a friend. And... Uh, I'm proud of him. I'm proud of the way God has risen him up and is using his life and uh, being a church planter and uh, running a conference in Guatemala. And so it's always a blessing to have him with us. And so let's welcome him as he comes tonight. Amen. Praise God. Amen. It's a wonderful privilege to be here. Um, uh, there's a whole lot more that can be said, but uh, I don't want to um, take up too much of your time. But uh, New Mexico is kind of my home away from home. And then over the years, uh, this, this church, this congregation, many of you here have been very, very, uh, uh, have been a great blessing to me and my wife, my family. Uh, your pastor, uh, more than he realizes, has been an inspiration to me as far back as when I was uh, first uh, given the church in Española, even before that, I went through a bout of kind of craziness and insanity in my life, and, and this church was very, very instrumental in helping me and my wife get our bearings and, and uh, ultimately step back into the will of God. And so, uh, like I said, there's so much that, I, that could be said here, and uh, so it's a great privilege to be here. Uh, it's wonderful to see my uh, daughter, my grandson, my son-in-law, they're uh, here, and we get to come and, and and uh, reconnect with them, reconnect with people from New Mexico. And so it's a great blessing. Amen. If you have your Bibles, 1 Samuel chapter 30. <clears throat> so the following uh, is a list uh, or a series of advertisements that were uh, in a small town newspaper uh, very interesting, this, the way this played out. This, this, uh, um, these advertisements went from Monday through Friday. I know uh, newspapers are kind of becoming a thing of the past. Everything is now online. But I, I found this article, I found it very interesting. Monday, the advertisement read like this. It says, <clears throat> The Reverend A.J. Jones has one color TV set for sale. Telephone number 626-1313 after 7 p.m. and ask for Miss Donnelly, uh, Donnelly, Donnelly, who lives with him cheap. Tuesday, we regret any embarrassment caused by Reverend Jones by a typographical error in yesterday's paper. The ad should have read, the Reverend A.J. Jones has one color TV set for sale, cheap. Telephone number 626-1313 and ask for Miss Donnelly, who lives with him after 7 p.m. Wednesday, the advertisement went like this. The Reverend A.J. Jones 
informs us that he has received several annoying telephone calls because of an incorrect ad in yesterday's paper. It should have read, the Reverend A.J. Jones has one color TV set for sale, cheap, telephone 626-1313, after 7 p.m. and ask for Miss Donnelly, who loves with him. Thursday, please take notice that I, the Reverend A.J. Jones, have no color TV set for sale. I have smashed it. Don't call 626-1313 anymore. I have not been carrying on with Miss Donnelly. She was my housekeeper until she quit yesterday. Friday, wanted a housekeeper, usual housekeeping duties, good pay, sincerely, Reverend A.J. Jones, telephone number 626-1313, amen. So mistakes are very common, especially in publications and uh, in businesses, this happens, things like this happen very often, but mistakes are also inevitable in life. How many can say amen to that? How many have made mistakes before? Amen. I, the rest of you are lying. <laughs> and so because mistakes are inevitable, I think it's very important that we learn, especially as people of God, we learn how to recover from them. That's the wonderful thing about God's grace. How many are grateful that God's merciful and gracious? Amen. I'm living proof of, of what can happen when you will get your heart right and see God move, allow God to move in your life, even in the course of mistakes. And so in our scripture this evening, David is a wonderful case study. Uh, you've heard sermons on David, and I'm sure your pastor I mean, knowing uh, the quality and caliber of preacher he is, I'm sure has touched on this subject. But I believe God really wants to help us this evening. You know, in 1 Samuel 13, 14, the Bible says David was a man after God's own heart. And so I find that very odd because when you read the whole life of David, we all know he made some major mistakes. But yet here we see that there's hope for you and I even when we've made mistakes. I want to preach a sermon I've entitled Overcoming Mistakes. 1 Samuel chapter 30. I uh, began reading uh, verse 1 through 8. The Bible says this, Then it happened when David and his men came to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had made a raid on the Negev and, uh, and, Zik and on Ziklag and had overthrown Ziklag and burned it with fire. And they took captive the women and all who were in it both small and great, without killing anyone, and carried them off and went their way. When David and his men came to the city, behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives and their sons and their daughters had been taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted their voices and wept until there was no strength in them to weep. Verse 5, now, David, uh, now David's two wives had been taken captive, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the widow of, Na of Nabal, the Carmelite. Moreover, David was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him, for all the people were embittered, each one because of his sons and his daughters. But David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Then David said to uh, Abiathar, the priest, the son of Abimelech, uh, Ahimelech, please bring me the ephod. So Abith uh, Abiathar, Abiathar, <laughs> brought the ephod to David. David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this band? Shall I overtake them? And he said to him, Pursue, for you will surely overtake them, and you will surely <clears throat> rescue all. Amen. Let's look at, first of all, mistakes that we make. Now, from the very beginning to the very end, the Bible is full of references to people that have made mistakes, made bad decisions. And so that's, to me, that's what makes the Bible such an honest book, because it's very uh, to the point, it's very honest, it talks about things that are very uh, relatable to you and I today. And so many of the, the, the characters in the Bible, the, the, the main characters in the Bible, are very similar to, to us. They've made mistakes. Uh, and, and so for me, as I've gone through my life, when you begin to fall in love with scripture, there are things in there that can help you when you're going through difficult times. And the Bible is, is one of those things that you can find where you can, when you read, you find encouragement, 
you find hope, and it shows that when those were able to overcome mistakes, when they were able to be restored, things can work out well. We also see in the Bible those that were not able to recover, those that made mistakes and the consequences uh, played out. Some were very extreme, some had very uh, dire and, and destructive endings. But the ones that we need to focus on in, in life are the ones that made bad decisions, but they, but they were able to recover. And so in life, we all can agree that many decisions can be made that are the wrong, the wrong ones. We make bad decisions in life. And uh, a lot of times when you look at our lives, maybe your life, of course, we, we're going to see this in the scripture. David like many of us, tend to make bad decisions out of fear. And so if we're honest tonight, a lot of us have, uh, fear will play out in our lives and really affect uh, a very clear mindset and, and help and affect us, uh, keep us from making good decisions. People tend to fear many things. Let's think about life. Think about what we do fear. We fear financial issues, uh, the fear of the future. We fear health, uh, what our health's going to be like. I can relate, and uh, as Pastor Ray mentioned my story, you know, I was sick. And, and so, you know, health is a big issue for many, especially as we're coming out of the whole COVID or right in the middle of the whole COVID pandemic era. Then we have those that are fear of failure in life, people that are afraid of failing. Then you have those that are just afraid of being Rejected and the whole idea and subject of rejection has a whole, it's a whole subject in itself that we don't have really a lot of time to, to cover tonight. But in our story, we do see very clearly David actually, it was because of fear that he made a very bad decision. And you can read, I'm not going to read the whole story, but back in 1 Samuel 27, verse 1. David thought to himself, one of these days I will be destroyed by the hand of Saul. The best thing I could do is to escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will give up searching for me anywhere in Israel, and I will slip out of his hand. So if you know the story of David, he had been uh, earlier in, in 1 Samuel, he's anointed king of Israel, 1 Samuel 16. 12 and 13, uh, Samuel, the prophet, anoints David, finds him, we know the story, he's in the field shepherding the sheep, and he brings him and he's anointed to be the future king of Israel. But what we see is as life played out in David's life, fear gripped him. He, he was afraid of what was going to happen. He was afraid of the way life was playing out around him. And so he gave into this fear. He gave into the way the things were, uh, were playing out in his life. And this basically caused him to lose trust in God. In his mind, he's saying, you know what? I'm, I'm running and things are not playing out. What happens if Saul gets me? And many times when I, I, I read this story, I can relate. And I'm sure this evening, if you'll be honest, we're all this way. You know, we know the word of God. We know what God has said for many of us. We know the words of promise for those that will lay a hold of uh, and, and trust in God and, and trust in his ways and, and live for him. But many times we're just like David. I know what the Bible says. Pastor, I know what you're saying. You're preaching. I know, I know, I know. But, and you can fill in the blank. We always have a but. I know what God says about my marriage, but pastor, you don't know my wife. I know what God says about my finances and my career, my job. He wants to care for me and help me, but you don't know my circumstance. You don't know uh, my area. You don't know the way things are playing out for me. And so we always have, you know, as believers, we know the will of God. We know what the word of God says. We hear sermons uh, three times a week conferences we hear sermons to encourage us and to help us but just like david fear will grip us out of fear and ultimately lack of trust in god we make wrong decisions and this is actually what's taking place here david he made a bad decision he says you know what 
I've got to take matters into my own hands. I'm going to figure out a way that I can be safe. And, and even though I know what God said, I'm going to take matters in my own hands. And here we see this story. He made a wrong decision out of this fear. And so this is the issue. This is the subject matter tonight. This is a subject matter for many believers. And I want to tell you tonight, if you can grasp this one very simple, very practical truth in life, you can have a future in, in what, you can have God's future in your life. Your destiny can work out well. How many would like God to move in their lives? Let me see your hands. I want to see how many people. God, I just want you to move. I want your, your hand to be on my life. You know, one of the great blessings for me has been spending some time with my, uh, my grandkids. We went camping. We uh, did a lot of things. They got to swim in a swimming pool. Just wonderful time. They're talking. And I'm just, God, I'm so grateful. And God, I want you to, I, I pray that things continue to go, that you continue to keep your hand on my life and bless my children Bless my grandchildren. God, help me to stay in your will. And ultimately, that should be all of our prayer. God, help me. I want you to move in my life. God, those promises, those things that you say are in my future. God, help me to stay focused. But here we have this truth. All humanity, we wrestle with making the wrong decisions. And those wrong decisions bring consequences. And so... Maybe tonight you've made bad decisions. Well, actually, we know we've all made bad decisions. But maybe you're here tonight and you're still trying to work through some things. I want to tell you there's hope for you and I. So let's look at the recovery. Verses 1 and 2 of our text. David and his men reached Ziklag on the third day. Now the Amalekites had raided the, ne the Negev and Ziklag. And they had att attacked Ziklag and burned it. And they had taken captive the women and everyone else in it, both young and old, they killed none of them, but carried them off as they went on their way. So here we have David, because of his mistake, his, his bad decision, now there's consequences playing out. And I can tell you, I've lived now enough to realize that my decisions really do have consequences, good or bad. You make bad decisions, there's going to be bad consequences. You make good decisions, the Bible says you reap what you sow. And so here we see David and those around him are feeling the brunt of his mistake and his bad decisions. And so this is really what happens. When you make a bad decision, the one making those decisions, you first, you're the first to feel the consequences of those decisions. Verse 6, it says, David was greatly Distress. You know, when you make a decision, whatever the, whatever the decision may be, but when it comes to the things of God, maybe uh, you uh, take a detour, maybe you backslide, maybe you just life, you don't make the right decisions in life. You know, oftentimes what happens, for, especially for men, you become embarrassed. Shame will latch on to you. Depression and sadness. One of the things in my church, I have been kind of working through and asking, you know, trying to get some advice and praying for some direction. As in, in the church, uh, Indio Church is uh, almost as old as the, the Las Vegas Church. We're 20, uh, 29 years, oh, I'm sorry, 37 years old. Been around a long time. And so as I stepped into that church, God began to challenge me. We began to Disciple men and, and God began to help us with strategy and vision But over the course of time I realized as I got to know the people we had At one time there was close to nine men in the church That had been back for redirection And so You know what a wonderful privilege to have men that had been out in the field But one of the things I wrestled with and that was frustrating Is a lot of these men Really didn't want to do anything for God They would come to church on occasion. Some of them didn't even come to church. And here I was, the new pastor. I'm trying to encourage them, and I, I'm, I'm desperately seeking God, calling my pastor, trying to figure out how can I help these men. And as I got to know a lot of these men, their wives, their children, many of them would carry on this shame. Many were depressed. A lot of them were sad. 
and they came back into the home church, they had no motivation, they had no heart, they had no spirit to do anything for God. They had no ability to move forward in life. And this becomes a problem when you realize, when, when things begin to play out in your life, and you begin to realize, you know what, I made a mistake. It's, sometimes it's really hard to process that, especially for uh, Norteños, amen? <laughs> Many times we have a hard time, just our pride, things happen. But here we see David, he's, a fr he's feeling this, man. He made a bad decision. Now it's playing out in his life. And then we see the other effects of this decision. One thing I've seen that whenever I make a bad decision, it's usually the people that I love the most that suffer the most. You know, David made a bad decision, but those around him, his family, his wife, his children, they have all, they are now feeling the brunt, the consequences of his bad decision. He decide, you know, he, he's taking matters in his, his own hands instead of trusting God. He says, I'm going to figure this out. God's not going to take care of me, so I'm going to take care of myself. And you know, of course, you, you know, it's such a crazy story. He joins with the enemy, the Philistines. And so now things are playing out and, and there's a lot of drama going on. But here, his family, his wives, his children, those that are serving him, they're, they're taken captive. And then the people began to lash out at him. Verse, 11, uh, verse 4, Then David and the people who were with him lifted their voices and wept until there was no strength in them to weep. Verse 6, Moreover, David was greatly distressed because the people spoke of stoning him, for all the people were embittered, each one because of his sons and his daughters. So this becomes, now we see how things begin to play out. So David made the mistake. He made a bad decision. His family now is feeling the brunt of that decision. David's feeling the brunt of his decision. And now you see those that are being affected, they begin to lash out and blame David. They begin to point their finger. And you know, I, I've seen this play out in, 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 in uh, my congregation. Whether people are back for redirection or people are back and maybe their ministry, they were leading a ministry, a band leader or something, and they're, they're, they're kind of trying to recuperate and recover, but it's just not working out for them. They're, they're angry at those around them. They're angry at pastor. They're angry at the brethren. They're, they're, they're unable to move forward. There's no more fellowship. They isolate themselves. And this is the issue that we see this playing out right here. And so the sad reality of this truth that I'm talking about tonight is for for, for too many, many are never able to recover. And this has been a thing for me as a pastor. My God, how, what can we do? God, we need your help. I need guidance. I need wisdom. And so as you look at this story, you, you, can, you can see what can happen, how bad things can get. But when you look at Scripture, brother, sister, listen to me. Scripture is full of hope for you and I as people. You know, the Bible tells us that God wants you and I to recover when we make bad mistakes. When you make a mistake, and you will, some mistakes are larger than others, but the Bible is full of a truth that God is into restoration and God is into recovery. God wants you to be restored. Can I tell you, people around you want to be restored. That's one of the big things, you know. I had one of the guys, well, pastor, you know, I'm, I'm here and things didn't work out, but, you know, everybody's looking at me the, the wrong way, like I'm a failure. I said, that's not true. He's trying to process this. But many times we think that people are looking at us a strange and a, and, and, and a crazy way. But can I tell you that, I, I think it's pretty safe to say this in this congregation. I know uh, quite a few of you. Maybe you're here and you're struggling, and it could be in the ministry, it could be just in your walk with God, but I can tell you very confidently, people around you want you to make it. Your pastor has a heart to see you make it, to find the will of God for your life. And so God wants you to make it, 
people want you to make it. And can I tell you, you, you need to want to make it. <laughs> Ultimately, that's what it comes down to. You've got to say, yes, I want to make it. I want to get through this. Too many people have sidelined entire destinies. This plays out in a lot of other areas. This plays out in marriages. One of the greatest blessings I've seen as a pastor, just seeing marriages restored and recover from the most crazy and most intense situations. Families restored. But you see many people that just walk out. They can't, they, they can't find it. They can't find the help they need. They can't find it in themselves. Families are destroyed. Ministries are hurt. Churches are hurt. Many just shut down and isolate themselves. Some will ignore and act like it never, you know, like if nothing happened, just pretend it, pretend that it, it you know, it, if I just ignore it, it'll go away. I, I was trying to find the article, but years ago I heard a story. And I want to say this, the, this story took place uh, in one of the hospitals here in New Mexico. I believe it was at, in Loveless in Albuquerque. But the story is there was a, a woman that would go in to see her doctor and, and uh, the doctor was a little taken, you know, he was taken back by her demeanor because she was very private. She, was, she wanted help. She ha was having some crazy symptoms, but she wouldn't let the doctor really examine her. And so the doctor was trying to tread lightly and trying to gain her trust. And so over a period of a few weeks, she's coming to see the doctor. And every time she comes in to see the doctor, she looks worse and worse. And the doctor is like trying to gain her trust. And, and she just says, you know, I, I think I just need some rest. Or maybe I need, can you prescribe me something because I'm weak and, and I'm not just doing well. And, and the doctor would try to examine her, but she would kind of push back and say, no, you know, I, don't, I know what I need. And so the doctor is trying to help her. One day she comes into her appointment. And the doctor notices something about her that she's weak, weaker than before. But also he notices there's a pungent smell. And he can't, he's, he's like, what's the smell? And so as he's examining her, he's like, man, this woman needs help. I need to admit her into the emergency room. Finally, he, he's able to convince her with a nurse to let, uh, let him uh, examine the woman. And as they begin to examine her, they discover that she has uh, a, a breast cancer. And it's so, it spreads so far that it's begun to rot and it's smelling and in her mind, she told the doctor, oh, I just thought that was an infection. I figured if you give me some medicine, it would go away. You know, many people, when you go through, a, people make a bad mistake or they fail, whether it's in, in their walk with God or just in life in general, there are those that try to ignore and just, oh, let's just move on and act like it never happened. Can I tell you, it doesn't work that way. That's what we see here. David is, like, this problem wasn't going away. Family was... In turmoil, people that had served him were angry at him. The Bible says they wanted to stone him. All this craziness, it's just not going away. But see, here we see in the stories we can recover. David, one of the things we see, and it's very, very critical, if you want help this evening, David says, you know what, I'm going to own this. David owns his mistake. He doesn't spend time fighting with the people. He doesn't, you know, blame them. Well, it's your fault. No, David says, this is my fault. I know what I did. He owns it. And one of the things we see often in life is we blame others. And I'm telling you, that's not, when, when you make a mistake, say, yes, I'm the dude that did the deed. I'm the one that did it. I see God. My mistake, my pride, my arrogance David, he takes it to heart. He says, you know what, I'm the one. You know, one of the problems we have, especially, and I, I, maybe it's not here, maybe I've just, just been gone too long, but in, in my church, there's a lot of prideful people. They'll blame everybody else. But listen to me this evening. It's absolutely critical that you and I understand 
If you want help, yes, God, it's me. I made, I, 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 I was afraid. I took matters into my own hands. David starts where it matters most. David goes to God. He realigns his relationship with God. Sometimes you've got to deal with the sin issue. You've got to be honest. Humility, repentance. Some of the songs we sing, creating me a clean heart. This is a, story, this is a, a picture of David's mindset when he's living and going through life. He says, God, I need you to help my heart. I Restore my heart. Create me a clean heart, God. Restore unto me the joy of my salvation. And this is why David is able, is able to recover. And he went through some crazy stuff in life. We've all heard the sermons. I don't have to go into all of the, 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 the craziness that he went through. But one of the things that's powerful is David was able to recover and move forward. This is where the strength comes. Verse 6, but David strengthened himself in the Lord his God. And so this is only going to happen when you trust God to recover from the mistakes that you've made. Verse 8, David inquired of the Lord, saying, Shall I pursue this band? Shall I overtake them? And he said to him, Pursue, for you will surely overtake them, and you will surely rescue all. So this really does tell us, show us God's heart. Can I tell you, when you and I would just humble ourselves before God, God says, yes, I'm going to help you. I will help you move forward. I will help you recover. I'm going to get involved. In, your heart is right. You've come to me. You've inquired of me. You realize the error of your ways. God says, I can work with that. And finally, we see tonight the help that comes one of the wonderful blessings of serving God, I, I mean, we can all talk about, we all have a testimony of what God has done. But I tell people one of the wonderful, to me, myself, the, the greatest thing about serving God is having an ability through God to process life, to deal with life. Not just the, the craziness of life, but to deal with my bad decisions. Everybody here has made mistakes. And it's so necessary. If you want to be able to move forward, if you want, if you want those around you, your wife, your children, those around you in your church, in your city, if you want to see God move in their lives through you and, and help you recover from your, your, your mistakes or your situation, God is into helping and he gets involved. God is willing to help. He will get involved. He will guide and give direction. Proverbs 3, verses 5 and 6, one of my favorite scriptures, trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding, in all your ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct your path. We know that scripture. But if you will hold on to that, Solomon wrote that. Son of David, David was able to instill that into his son. You're going to need God to help you when you fail, when you make the mistakes, when things happen because your lack of trust or fear has gotten a hold of you. You can say, God, I need your help. Because God will guide you. You know, I find it amazing. We see how, what, what lengths God is willing to go to to help David. In verses 11 through 15 of our text, you can read it on your own time, but as David begins to pursue the enemy, he doesn't know which way to go, but how convenient. They're out looking for their family. The Bible tells us that they run into a man, an Egyptian servant, who just so happened to be a servant to the Amalekites. He had been left for dead. David feeds the guy and just... All of a sudden, now this man is so eager to help David. You know what? I'll tell you where they are. I'll tell you how to beat them. How many know that doesn't, that's not normal? 
That's a, to me, that's a supernatural dynamic. God says, okay, I'm going to help you. I want to tell you, listen to me, God will get involved. And I'm talking supernaturally. You know, we, we, we tend to forget that God is a God of miracles. What is a miracle? A miracle is something that cannot be done through natural means. It's something that's impossible. Things like this, God says, I will help you. Your heart is right. You desire to move forward. I'm going to get involved. And God says, here. And God just, and, and what's interesting is God already put this into play since before. It's like, how many know God's very smart? <laughs> I'm amazed. I have a little brother, and very quickly I want to share this testimony. A little brother, he's the youngest of five boys. And for the last, up until this past nine months, Last 12 years, he was living in the streets of Española, hooked on heroin, been a backslider, been in and out of the church, married, divorced. It's a crazy situation. He was hooked on heroin, called me a few times. I would try to help him, but of course, it wasn't working out. And I told him, look, JJ, until you're ready to get clean, Calls me one day, he's from an, an abandoned building. He's living in a, in a house with no roof. It's raining, and he's like, man, I can't, I'm tired of this. Long story short, I tell him, if you can get clean, I said, I'll, I'll help you. You're my little brother. A series of events take place. He, God moves, gives him a second chance. He was facing, if I remember correctly, 28 years in prison. Gets clean, we move him to Indio. Gets off the plane, he comes, he says, you know what, Carlos, I'm just so tired of being, I'm tired of this. He says, I need God's help. And I told him, I said, it's not going to be easy. I said, I'm not here just to give you a handout. He humbled himself, he's made some good decisions. And so in a period of eight months, he's gone from being homeless, facing close to 30 years in prison. His record is completely wiped clean. He's managing a restaurant making almost $60,000 a year, serving God. And just the other day in prayer, he was telling me, he says, he says why does God even care about people like me? Can I tell you, that's the God we serve. He can help you. It doesn't matter your situation. We've all made mistakes. And one of the, and I, I'm sure Pastor Ray would agree, one of the tragedies, one of the hardest things for me, he's been pastoring a lot longer than me, but one of the things I have a heart, it's like seeing people as they make one bad decision after another, knowing that God wants to help them. And he will put things in place if you will surrender your heart and say, yes, God, it's me. I'm going to seek you. I'm going to make some decisions. I'm going to do what I got to do. God gets involved. He'll put things in place. It's a supernatural element. Verses 17 through 19, you can see God got involved. They, he brought a, a great victory. They were able to recover and restore, God restored his family. Total recovery, total blessing and protection. That just doesn't happen, but it does happen to God's people. Recovering from mistakes will affect your future. Recovery will unlock blessing and destiny, not just for you, but for those around you. It was this, this victory you can read later on in 2 Samuel 2, this victory that <clears throat> as David was able to get, you know, recover and God was able to move in his life, all of a sudden now, this victory, then David actually gives a great offering to, uh, to the people of Judah, and here you see, now because of this testimony, this victory, God is able to use that and, and people come get behind David and then later on in 2 Samuel 2, David is anointed king and he takes his rightful place as king. And I think about that as how God used that to bring his, his plan to pass in David's life. And that's to me one of the major issues that's what hinges, that's what's, that's what's in the balance tonight. 
Because I wonder what would have happened if David never would have recovered. I want to tell you this evening, if there's so much that we don't know that is dependent on whether you or I, you and I are able to recover in times of mistakes and failure. The future. Your children. Should God tarry? As long as it takes till he comes back, I want to tell you there are destinies, there are families in the balance that are dependent on whether or not you're able to build a testimony and recover from that, th th this, this failure, this mistake, a difficult time in your life. When we learn to recover from failure, God is able to bring growth and maturity. One man said, character is built and formed as we work through our mistakes. They help to prepare us for the future. They help us in the future. He goes on to say, the greatest blunders, like the thickest ropes, are often made up of several compounded and compressed strands. If you take the rope apart and separate it into its individual small threads that make it the, ro that, that make it the rope, they're easily to break individually. But if you twist them all together, compress them tightly, you have something strong that can withstand anything. One of the wonderful things in people like, you know, my little brother JJ, some of you here have amazing testimonies. Ronnie and Angel, Jaime and Georgia. You know, when life happens and we make mistakes, one of the most powerful things in all of life is the testimony of what God can do. Of when people say, you know what, people of God, I, God, I'm your son, I'm your daughter, I'm gonna focus on you. The future God is in your hands, I'm gonna trust in you, I'm gonna hold on to you. First John 4, verse four, greater is he who is in you than, is he, than he who is in the world. I wanna tell you, you know, there's no, you know, we're, how many know we're in the last days? How many believe that? You see God move. He's moving now. Things are happening. One of the things that's been on my heart as of late is, oh God, I, I want everybody in my church, everybody, you know, what, what, wouldn't it be a great thing if all of us just make it to heaven together in the rapture? No, we can make it. You can make it. And we have everything we need to make it tonight if we'll just trust God. And when we make the mistakes, we recover. Let God be God in our lives. I mean, that's all I have. Let's bow our heads. Heads about eyes are closed. Thank you for listening and your patience tonight. Before we're dismissed, I want to very quickly just ask if there are people here, maybe you're visiting, maybe you come by an invitation of a friend, and you're here tonight and you're listening to what I'm saying and you're just like, man, you know, I wish I could have that kind of godly intervention in my life. I want to tell you, all of us can have it. Every single one of us can have God's help and, and His guidance and direction and intervention. But it takes the first step of just surrendering to God. Say, yes, God. When I, I, need, I need you to forgive me of my sins. I, I, sin is, is what separates us from God. And so tonight, if you'd be honest uh, and say, you know what? Preacher, I, I'm, I'm not right with God. My relationship with God is not what it's supposed to be. I, I don't even really understand what it is to be saved. It's, it's a simple thing. It's just, the Bible says, confess with your mouth, believe with your heart, and you can be saved. We'd like to help you with that tonight. We'd like to pray with you if you would let us. If there's anyone here, you're not a Christian, you're not saved, but you would like to give your life to Jesus tonight. No one's looking around. Just lift your hand right now. Pastor, can you pray with me? I want to give my life to Jesus. I'm not saved. I'm not right with God. Here's my hand. Quickly, lift your hand. Anyone at all, front to back. It doesn't matter if, you're, if you've been here for a long time. You've been here for years, but maybe you've never surrendered your life to God. Maybe you're just visiting. Don't be embarrassed. If that's you, lift your hand quickly. Maybe you're a backslider. If you're a backslider, you understand what that word means tonight. I'm not going to go into that, but... 
The good news is, is God brought you here because he wants to help you. There was a period in my life where I was like a chronic backslider. It's like I could never make it. I could never last. And I was always frustrated. But I'm telling you, God's grace. You're here tonight. You're, maybe you're like, man, I, every time I pray and I go right back and do the same thing. I want to tell you what, you can, God will help you right now if you will surrender. Don't let that be a reason for you not raising your hand tonight. Unsaved or backslidden this evening. If that's you, lift your hand. Pastor, can you pray with me? I want to give my life to Jesus. It doesn't matter who you are. Quickly, front to back, side to side. You're in a position where you need to recover. Things are not working out the way they're supposed to. And you know it's your, it's your, it's your decisions, bad decisions. You're not where you're supposed to be. God's here for you tonight. Lift your hand. Praise God. I want to speak to the church very quickly. I'm not going to preach the whole sermon again, but... Recovery and, and getting back to where you need to be has, is always a struggle. And it's not good enough just to just be there and just go through the motions. I want to tell you it's so important that you and I learn to actually recover and, and be restored. To be restored and when we make decisions, when we make mistakes, when things aren't, we're not doing and being what we're supposed to be. The wonderful news tonight is God is into restoration. God is into helping us, restoring marriages, testimonies. So tonight, if God is dealing with you in any way, shape, or form, we're going to give you some time to do business with God. Let's stand in this place. The altars are open. If God is here, I'm not, I mean, if you're here, God is speaking to you tonight. You need to respond. Yes, that's me. I need to stay focused, God. Help me not to... Be prideful and, and let things distract me. The future. I'm going to hold on to you, God. Give me guidance. Maybe you're at a point where you need God to intervene. God, I'm here and I'm moving forward. God, intervene. Bring guidance. Bring direction. He'll bring all of that. And then we're going to sing a song this evening. Fix my eyes on you, the author of my faith. Casting aside every sin in every way, I fix my eyes on you. I lay my burdens down, letting the cares of this world now fade away. One thing I ask, one thing I see. And I may dwell in your house, O oh Lord, my, my King. King. And all the days oh of my God, life, I thank you, God, for your I want to gaze us, upon your oh, beauty Lord Jesus. and seek you in this, this holy place. place. I fix my eyes on oh, you, oh God, help us, the author of my faith. Casting aside every sin in every way I fix my eyes on you I lay my burdens down Letting the cares of this world now fade away One thing I ask Is one thing I see I may dwell in your house, O oh Lord, my King. And all the days oh God, of my life, grace. I want to gaze upon your beauty and seek you in this holy place. One thing I ask, this one thing I seek. I may dwell in your house, O oh Lord, my, my King. In all the days of my life, I want to gaze upon your beauty and seek you in this holy place. And I just want to pray tonight for this congregation. I, one of the things, amen, you can just stay where you're at. Amen. I just want to pray really quick and I do believe that in these times that we are in, there's 
an all out, an, an, an all out assault on those that have been saved for any length of time, those that, have ha those that have a testimony, those that have ministry. And so tonight I just want to, before I leave, I want to ask God's help and strength and I want to pray uh, God's blessing, God's guidance. And maybe you're, you're in a place in your life where you're just, you're, you, you want to move forward, but you're just, it's just not, it's not happening. I'm going to believe God that tonight God's going to help you. You're going to be able to put some things in place and be able to come to God with an open heart and say, God, you know, this is, this is the issue. It's me. And, and you're going to be able to ask God for, to guide you and you're going to be able to follow that guidance. I believe in God to continue to do great things here in this church. And let's bow our heads. I want to pray. Father, I thank you, God, for your, your mercy, God, your goodness, your faithfulness. I pray right now, God, for every person in this church, God, every brother, every sister, God, maybe those that are watching online right now, Father, that in their life, they're at this place, God, where they're just stuck, it seems like. The devil has actually ripped them off and taken so much from them. In Jesus' name, I take dominion over the lies, over the strategies from hell. God, I pray right now an encouragement. God, a breath of fresh air upon every, every brother, every sister, every person in this place, those that are watching online. God, I pray victory. I pray dominion. I pray guidance, God, and strategy. I pray, God, your anointing that you would continue to use this congregation, continue to, to move God in their midst. And I thank you, God, for your goodness, your mercy. I give you praise and I give you honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's give God a clap offering as your pastor comes. Amen. Thank God that he meets with us. We come into the house of God. Let's bow our heads in the presence of God. You be an encouragement to someone. Be a blessing as we go our way. David Jackson, dismiss us in prayer.